All right, we might get started because I've got a few slides to run through before we jump into the talk. Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining. It's great to have you all here. Um, so today we have a talk by Professor EJ Holden um, from the University of WA. Uh, but as I mentioned, just a couple of uh, housekeeping slides and some information for you all. Um, so firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our corporate members. So a big thank you to our Corporate Plus members, High Size, Total Seismic and Bell Size, and our corporate members, Southern Geoscience Consultants, Santos, Down Under Geophysics and Transparent Earth Geophysics. So our corporate members um, make a financial contribution to the society, but also to the, the ASCG's Research Foundation. So we're gr very grateful for their contribution. I'd also like to thank our branch sponsors who help to make our monthly events possible. Um, so thank you very much to all of these sponsors shown here. And if you're interested in becoming a branch sponsor or a corporate member, uh, just let us know. You can send an email or look on our website. Uh, thank you. Um, so the, the, for the talk today, uh, just so this is a Zoom webinar. And so we'll be using the Q&A function for questions. So it should be, um, there's a few different uh, uh, versions of Zoom floating around at the moment, but uh, there should be a Q&A button somewhere, um, usually on a panel along the bottom, and you can type in your questions. And at the end, uh, I'll read these questions out to EJ and she can answer them. Um, alternatively, at the end, you can also use the raise hand function if you'd rather ask your question verbally. Um, and if you, if all else fails, you could type it into the chat if you're having trouble finding the Q&A. Uh, we've got a couple of upcoming webinars in the next few weeks. Uh, so on the 2nd of February, which is next Tuesday, we have Dr. Mehdi Tork Kashkai, who will be talking about seismic imaging of the crust using Bayesian joint inversion of teleseismic P wave coder autocorrelation waveforms. And then on the 16th of February, uh, in the afternoon, we have a talk uh, by Dr. Kate Selway, um, and more information about that will be out to your email shortly or on the ASCG website. And just a reminder, if you haven't already renewed your ASCG membership for the year, now is a great time to do so. Or if you aren't a member, um, this is just a teaser for some of the uh, great uh, offers that come with an ASCG membership. Um, for example, you get free access to our technical journal, Exploration Geophysics, um, a copy of Preview in the Mail every couple of months, which has the latest Exploration Geophysics and uh, news. Um, you get reduced entry to the AEGC conference. And so our next conference is in September this year in Brisbane. So um, that alone sort of outweighs the financial output for joining up. Um, and a number of other offers that I won't go into, but you can find them all on our website. And to keep up to date with what's happening with the ASCG, um, feel free to follow us on social media. And all of the videos from these webinars are on the ASCG YouTube channel, so you can find them here. And this video will be uploaded um, as well. So, um, we are very lucky to have Professor EJ Holden here today to talk about geological knowledge discovery using machine augmented intelligence. So Professor Holden received her bachelor's, master's and PhD in computer science from the University of WA. Her postgrad and postdoc research focused on developing visualization, automated image analysis and machine learning techniques for hand gesture recognition. Then in 2006, she made a change to geoscience and currently leads the geodata algorithm team at UWA, where that team effectively spans the boundaries of computational science, geoscience, and links academia and industry. The team's research resulted in the commercialization of three software products, CET grid analysis and CET porphyry detection extensions for OASIS montage, and televiewer image analysis methods in the image and structure interpretation workspace for ALT's WellCAD. These products had significant uptake by the resource industry globally, and recently their research also resulted in two industry-driven patents on machine-assisted drill hole data interpretation methods. 
Currently, Professor Holden leads a major industry-funded research engagement named the UWA Rio Tinto Iron Ore Data Fusion Projects. Her team won the UWA Vice Chancellor Award in Impact and Innovation in 2015, and she was a winner of the Women in Technology in WA uh, Tech 20 Awards in 2019. Uh, so some pretty impressive achievements there and a very dynamic and uh, exciting group that Professor EJ Holden leads. Um, so with that, I will uh, switch off my screen sharing and invite uh, EJ to share her screen and um, welcome her to the webinar. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, so can you see my screen? Okay, yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Right. Thanks. Um, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Um, in this talk, um, we've been working closely with the mining industry for the last 14 years. And the deployment of those commercial products that Kate has mentioned as well as our recent work that uh, we deploy some machine learning systems to uh, major mining operations. Um, and uh, the lesson that we have learned is that the machine solutions that we provide really should be augmenting human decisions to really help humans make intelligent decisions based on um, not only machine solutions, but also their knowledge as well with a specific aim to um, assist the interpretation of geology and also the knowledge discovery uh, of the geology as well. So if you're talking about data, the geoscientists use diverse types of data, ranging from field observations um, to data that, uh, that are collected from the rock samples, and also from the remotely sensed techniques, as well as geological documents, which actually has a wealth of information and knowledge. Now, so in data, uh, it has got two different types of data that you usually deal with, which is the, one is a structured data. That is a data that's stored in a structured form, like spreadsheets where you have a, a petrological measurements um, are stored in a spreadsheet. But you also have unstructured data here, which is not only geological documents, but you also have some field observations that you wrote to report on. Or there might be some field observation system where it allows a text to be entered as well, as well as categorical um, and structured data. So Using these diverse types of increasing volumes of data, geoscientists um, use them to extract information um, that is to do with the lithology, maybe structures, maybe stratigraphy, interpretation. Um, but when you use this type of uh, data analysis to extract information, this information is really a refined form of data as well. Now, using this type of information to human decisions, for example, where to drill next for mineral explorers or in a resource development um, stage of the workflow in minerals industry, really what you are using is not only the information you extracted from data, but more collective information that you um, have uh, acquired using your domain knowledge as well, which is probably based on your academic training and your experience and your learning. Um, so hopefully the decision you make, such as where to drill next, is also based on not only knowledge, but also wisdom as well. So this is um, a statement by Freudman in his um, uh, geological re reasoning um, literature that actually shows about how we have lots of data, but we are seldom in possession of all the data for geological interpretation. 
Um, I guess we all understand the complexity of geology, but the data that we have is seldom enough, which means that we have a very data rich, but probably information poor situation here. Um, and the added complexity is that some of the data that you use is really also a biased maybe because it, they may be interpreted. So as a result, our interpretation really is to do with that filling in the gaps um, in our knowledge with interpretation with some assumptions that we hope that will be subsequently confirmed. So this, uh, our knowledge, the filling in the gap um, that might be uh, presuppositions based on your um, academic training and experiences. And that makes these interpretations highly variable and um, leading to uncertainty. So you might have heard this very well-known work by Claire Bond um, on seismic interpretation uncertainty. And you may also have heard about this uh, Yasnans and Sivaraja's work um, from our group who actually analyzed this uncertainty in magnetic data interpretation, specifically in uh, target spotting of porphyry targets or magnetic data. Um, Yatsu's work has shown that it has a high variability, not only across individuals, but within individuals as well, depending on how they view the data or what kind of visualization technique that you use. Um, to display the data for your interpretation. So because of this uncertainty in human interpretation, there has been a surging interest um, accompanying with the advances, recent advances and the adaptation of machine learning and artificial intelligence in um, wider communities that uh, geoscience communities has been um, adopting and um, for various applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So just give a, a quick definition here. Artificial intelligence is basically building a machine that mimics human intelligence. It's understanding what we see or what we hear or what we read or even how we feel and uh, how we um, think um, and how we make decisions. Now, machine learning is a critical component of this artificial intelligence, where we give computers ability to learn and act without being explicitly programmed. I often use this very um, simple example of online shopping suggestions. So if you buy an item X, um, and you can actually build an algorithm, say someone is buying item X, that, that you just suggest item Y. But machine learning algorithms can learn from a large number of um, customer buying patterns and use that learning to model your um, the learn, machine learning model and to use them to predict and suggest what is the item Y that should be going with item X. So make that suggestion. Uh, for online shopping. Um, deep learning, on the other hand, <clears throat> is a subset of machine learning where it uses the sophisticated machine learning algorithms, which is based on artificial neural networks. So many of you might be accustomed to um, familiar with what artificial neural networks look like. It has got nodes, um, the computational units, and are called neurons, and it had they are connected, um, and uh, this connectivity it has got weights on it that actually shows that um, strength of that connectivity. Now, deep learning is based on these artificial neural networks, but it uh, distinguishes itself uh, by a depth of layers it uses, and the actual complexity of this architecture. Now. A prime example would be the convolutional neural network or called CNN, which actually made a step change in computer vision or image recognition. So this uh, 
CNN is actually based on, of course, artificial neural networks, but using a various scale or various um, feature uh, filtering processes at different layers of neural networks, and which can actually learn very complex representation of features within images. So, as uh, many of you might know, the CNN has basically made a revolution or step change in computer vision. Um, you will see in this talk that a number of uh, deep learning uh, methods that are popping up. And um, this machine learning in general um, can take different approaches like supervised learning where it needs lots of da label data to train your model. Um, label data means, so for example, if you are doing a mineralogy classification uh, using machine learning, you need a label data, um, let's say using spectral data to classify mineralogy, then you need the spectral responses and uh, actually labeled as a mineralogy X or Y um, as a labeled uh, the, its class to be used for the supervised learning paradigm. Um, unsupervised learning, for example, uh, on the other hand, doesn't use label data and it can be based on the similarities between the um, input features to, let's say, uh, group different um, data based on their similarity or different patterns. Now, you can also um, probably approach this as a semi-supervised learning where you need only a, a, just a small number of label data or there might be a reinforcement learning where the um, intelligent agents actually use um, this making actions, taking actions based on the cumulative rewards. Now, or you have a transfer learning where you actually use a pre-trained um, model and then apply to a, a similar or unrelated, uh, similar but related tasks. Or you can probably use also active learning where it actually involves end user humans to actually in the learning process. So in general, in geoscience, machine learning algorithms are mainly used for classification or that classify unseen sample data into known classes that uh, uses the supervised learning paradigm. Or you can use clustering, which is like grouping sample data based on their similarities. Now, uh, there has been many applications that um, use this machine learning to classify or identify mineralogy, lithology, stratigraphy structures, and uh, often use the mineral prospectivity analysis as well as rock texture analysis. So we have all these machine learning um, algorithms that are available at our disposal, but um, we need to be aware of the challenges that we are faced in geological data analysis. If you look at how the interpreters um, use the data sets, those um, diverse types of data sets, the challenges that we are facing is not only just the complexity, the variability of geology in different areas, and also the data sparsity and uncertainty. If you're talking about the um, resource uh, development environment, which is quite data rich, uh, you're talking about eight centimeter diameter borehole in a 50 meter by 50 meter grid. And uh, really within a grid, you are only covering by the drill hole, it's a 0.0002% of the area. So this sparsity actually makes it quite challenging if you're trying to model whatever you have observed in the drill hole into a 3D spatial distributed um, a surface. So not only that, we also have the uncertainty with not only the measurement errors, but also uh, interpreted data where human uncertainty goes in as well. Now, another um, aspect of challenge is that how do you integrate this um, different modality data 
which was captured at different sampling resolutions um, in an integrated meta, uh, manner to uh, drive an interpretation. So um, these are the challenges that are faced by interpreters, but this also brings challenges for data science applications as well. Now, this variability of geology, for example, is actually a, a problem because you can't just build one model um, and train it in one for one geological setting and then try to deploy it another setting um, or another area. Now, also, because this is actually what in computer science called low resource domain. So because in, in domain of geology, we really don't have um, a lot of reliable label data for supervised learning for machine learning algorithms, for example. So uh, this is leads to problems for data science applications that are difficult to model and also validate outcomes. And integration of different modality data at different resolutions. This is an area I think we believe that much research needs to be done. And also dealing with data types that are different degrees of uncertainty. How do you deal with that in integration? So um, our team's research so far has been really how to address some of these issues and the solution that we are um, using at this point is how we can integrate machine solutions to assist the human decisions where the human knowledge, um, their domain knowledge has to be really incorporated into that um, system. So in this talk, I will present um, two studies. One is stratigraphy interpretation um, tool that we developed for multimodal drill hole data interpretation. And uh, that uses machine learning to um, classify those uh, strands or the um, stratigraphic units or subunits and from using three different types of drill hole data. And um, the second study that I'm gonna present is we're going a little bit just beyond information extraction, where we are going into more of a geological knowledge discovery space, where we can use machine learning and natural language processing and AI to extract geological um, information or knowledge, such as all forming conditions, or the concepts from these geological documents. Um, so the first part of my talk is this stratigraphy interpretation um, system that uh, Daniel Wedge developed in our team um, in collaboration with Rio Tinto INO. These are the two systems that are kind of related and you will see the relation uh, during my uh, presentation. And the main system that I'm presenting is a machine assisted drawl hole data interpretation um, tool called MADI. Now, both of these uh, systems, um, including this automated validation assistant, we have a patent application uh, by Rio Tinto, I know, uh, Rio Tinto, and they are published work. So you can actually have a look at this uh, publication if you wish. Now, the MADI was developed for resource evaluation team. Now, they actually um, interpret these multiple um, data sets in an integrated manner to identify the strand units, as I mentioned, it's uh, stratigraphic units or subunits as shown in the figure, a stratigraphic column um, for the Hammersley group here. So the data that we are using is multi-element assays um, that are captured at two meter intervals. And we also use geological logging uh, or material type logging. We'll, I will explain a little bit more later, which are also um, acquired at two meter intervals. Uh, so this multi-element assays and geological logging, they're all from the RC chips, um, that uh, from the chips from the RC holes. Now, this uh, geological logging 
that uh, we are using is actually uh, validated later against assays. And uh, that is the work that is related to AVA that I'm going to explain a little later. So the another data set we are using is the downhole geophysics um, data. In this case, we had uh, uh, different measurements, but we use gamma at this point, which is about 10 centimeter intervals as well. Now, once these uh, interpretations are done for each drill hole, um, the interpretations from this, all these different holes are used as a basis for block modeling. So this is where we use convolutional neural network I explained before. Um, we use three different data sets, uh, as mentioned, that we use gamma. That is actually important because the, these gamma signatures are related to identifying shale bands. And, and which is an important marker and where you know where you are at the stratigraphic sequence um, in the mining area. And essays that we use are shown listed at, in the slides and we use each element's percentages as input to a CNN, which provide a classifier output for each strand. And the logging, the material types that is actually a composition of material types that is uh, logging um, that you use for this uh, CNN. And uh, that actually has got mineralogy um, and texture and also the property handling, material handling properties as well. And uh, this um, material types and the percentage has been logged from the rig. Now, this each material types percentage is also used as an input to a CNN. And uh, when you actually look at these outputs, you have X axis, which shows the strength and the Y axis shows the depth. So um, each of these outputs show that the likely strength has got the more wider area um, and uh, along the depth that you will see the classifier outputs. Once we have this classifier outputs, what do we do with it is I think the key to success. Um, so MADI from the classifier outputs, what we really need to achieve as a final interpretation is really tracing along the depth at, at, at each interval, what is the most likely strand units that we have identified? So as you can see in a yellow line in a final interpretation, we are really finding a path along this CNN output. Now that's where it gets a little bit tricky because uh, you have a three outputs from three different modalities and they are really not sufficient enough to make interpretation that gives you that um, confidence uh, for their decisions on the final interpretation. Because we need to make sure this actually aligns with um, geological knowledge that the human interpreter has uh, about the area. So we need to give a geologically feasible solution that can maximize their confidence in interpretation. That's where we um, approach this uh, using this seamless integration of human and machine intelligence, but importantly supported by other existing data as well. So this is how we approach it using interactive visual analytics. So we have um, downhole gamma, and we have a logging and essay outputs from um, CNN. But there are two other data sets that human interpreters typically use um, to, for the interpretation. One is a historical model, and the other one is a logged stratigraphy. Um, even though this logged stratigraphy is generally very coarse and it's done from the rig, Nevertheless, it actually gives a bit of an information about what the geologist observed in the, at the rig. So um, this historical model and log stratigraphy is also generated as an input 
And what we do is using this uh, technique called Blender. And you will actually be able to find the details from our publication by Peter Covesi, um, as shown below. And what we are trying to do is we get user to drive this integration of outputs from C CNN classifiers, as well as old um, existing data. So this interactive visualization um, technical blender, you can actually move the actual dot in this blender to combine a different data sets um, by giving different weights. So once you choose what is the weights that uh, you've given to different, <clears throat> different images as shown, um, we actually then result in the weighted classifier outputs. Um, I was informed that the geos find who use this system find that the truth is always somewhere in the middle. So um, combining, integrating all new and old data sets are kind of important step here. And once we have uh, a combined or weighted outputs, then we go through an optimization process to find this uh, path that's shown in the yellow line in this figure. Now, we use the dynamic time warping technique, which is a very standard, well-known um, technique for tasks such as this. But what was important here is that we apply some constraints to achieve this geologically feasible interpretation. One is the known strand sequence of the area. And as you know, that when you have a fault so dikes, it actually changed the sequence significantly. And also strand thickness as well, because these informations were available to us, uh, we brought in as a constraint and to uh, find this path um, through optimization process. Of course, there is a user editable uh, features um, added in, so they can modify the strand sequence to insert faults or overturning and dikes, and ent entire strands can be turned off as well. Um, I think the important part is giving a, a real-time update and also showing this 3D context as shown in the top right of this slide. So as a result, we have this MADI, which is using three different modality data, drill hole data, using a, a classifier based on machine deep learning. And we are actually integrating different um, existing old data sets and uh, providing human interpreters to make decisions. And then we actually go through the optimization again constrained and uh, requiring human input to generate this final interpretation. As you can see, this um, the time that people um, take to actually drive this uh, drill or interpretation is actually quite a, a significant time for geos. As you can see, the machine intelligence is used here, but really it is helping to drive the decisions um, by, with a significant effort to drive that uh, improve that confidence in that in interpretation. So I mentioned that we go through all this human input. The, the validation process of MEDI is really an automated process. So we use the classifier outputs and we use the uh, weights, um, just giving all equal weights uh, to all of these outputs and the existing data. And then um, using an optimization, um, using these uh, constraints and then just trace it without any human input. So use that um, output as uh, for our validation of MADI. And you can actually see there are three types of validation um, method that we used here. 
One is just uh, using these um, adjacent matrix um, that it shows that the for each strand interpretation by human and by actual MADI, which is automated in this case. So manual versus algorithm generated strands for each interval we uh, for about 11,428 intervals we found that the exact match was about 68.1%. However, um, human interpretation, I believe is very coarse and it they smooth the actual interpretation baby um, along the sequence. So if we're using the adjacent trend as a correct match as well, we are really getting about 85.93% um, match. And also we used the uh, holes, um, only the holes with uh, detrital materials locked, which is uh, 248 holes. And we found that the basement trend analysis showed that 93 holes lie exactly on the diagonal um, and uh, 123 further holes interpreted um, adjacent strands. So in total, we achieved about 87.1% match. And another um, the validation that we've done is the depth difference um, of the basement depth difference between the manual and auto interp. Um, it shows that they actually have a quite good correlation, but just that uh, generally auto interp overestimate the basement depth related to the manual interpretation. Um, all of these uh, methods and uh, experimental results are detailed in our publication. So I will um, have you refer to that if you are interested. So I've just presented MADI, but this geological logging data that we use, as I mentioned before, it's actually logged material types from the rig, but this is actually validated by another system called AVA. Now, if you are using very highly um, uncertain data sets for your machine learning, this is not really ideal. So in this case, the geological logging, which can be highly variable and uncertain, is actually validated, making sure that the quality is actually uh, good for our classifier. So auto-validation assistant, which is actually um, developed prior to MEDI, which for um, our operation as well. And this is to validate human logging of material types from the rig using geochem data once you come back from the lab. Now, the intervals, uh, two meter intervals were logged and uh, they actually logged as a composition uh, compositions of material types. As I said, it, actually include the mineralogy texture and handling properties. And uh, very good for us, it actually this material type has got this material type classification scheme that allows for each material type a theoretical assay hardness, lump fine splits with corresponding geochem differences and so on. So because we had this theoretical assay values um, associated with these material type compositions, we um, once the geochem data assays comes from the lab, we can actually validate them. So previously, the manual validation process is basically correcting the percentages of these material types as well as uh, swapping different material types if that um, the error the difference between the theoretical and the lab assays are not um, right. Um, this actually is a very important to get this material type right because it's essential for accurate grade estimation as well as managing risk in blending strategy uh, for the company. Now, you would think that we have uh, theoretical um, assays and as well as the lab assays and the modifying these percentages of this material type is a, a straightforward mathematical optimization. 
Um, but what we have found is that really it is not um, possible to give geologically acceptable solutions um, just doing that. So what we have done here is that we built AVA by um, collecting human data, trying to actually learn how the top, the best validators, um, expert validators, uh, change their material types, um, swapping material types, depending on the assay error. So we collected these uh, swapping patterns that the expert validators do. And we also learned some association rules from legacy data. So what are the types of combinations of uh, material types that coexist and can be um, observed together? So using data mining techniques, we actually uh, collected these association rules, uh, just like uh, um, finding what are the online shopping combinations that you can find. Um, once we have this kind of learned information that we used it to, for this optimization process. So once you have a logged um, composition that comes in and uh, we basically, the final goal is making sure that the logged composition, um, the theoretical essays and the uh, difference within the theoretical as well as the lab essays uh, are minimized. So we have a material type modification uh, based on the swaps that we learned. And then we optimize the material type percentages by minimizing assay error, but also changes in lump percentage and hardness as well. And then we also have some penalty in this optimization process based on stratigraphy, conflicting material types and textures as well. Now, once iteratively finding um, the material type compositions and percentages, we go through another final penalty calculation based on these chip shapes, color and association rules that we learned from the legacy data. So then we propose a uh, the, um, some uh, set of a possible solution, of course, ranked um, uh, from the most preferred to the least preferred. And uh, then the expert validator can sit and either choose one of the compositions that um, Ava has suggesting, or they can, of course, make their own validated um, material type percentages as well. So the evaluation is performed. Um, we're using 1,996 intervals. We achieved about 74% um, of the times that the validators accepted the AVA solution without change. Now then the deposit scale validation was performed to where 14,600 intervals. And we compared um, the logged compositions, manually validated compositions, and top-ranked AVA compositions. Um, so the results that are shown here is uh, compared in terms of error tolerance factor, which is proportion of the allowed error for that essay element. Um, so the factor of one means that it has maximum allowable error for essay element. So we use the four types of intervals. Uh, we categorize them. One is the detrital, second is the mineralized bedded intervals and shale intervals, as well as all intervals. So we have these uh, four elements that are shown here. And as you can see that the logging done at the rig and then manually validated shown in orange and the AVA validated uh, is shown in gray. As you can see that AVA performed really well, um, kind of comparable to manual in some cases better. So I just presented you the stratigraphic interpretation tool. And I think the key to success of um, being able to deploy such system is really the seamless integration of machine learning. 
and human expert knowledge. And of course, the all data using visual analytics. Now, the second part of this talk is um, now about discovering geological knowledge from documents. And this is a very much a change of scene, but what um, I think is that it, in the future, if we really want to um, interlink different databases, so you have a drill hole data, you have uh, exploration reports, um, and you have a field observation. If you want to link these um, databases for intelligent search, then the first step is converting this unstructured data, which is text data, into a structured form that we can actually integrate with other structured data and some intelligence that um, probably similar to what I described earlier. So let's have a look at this work here. So when you read a text like this about the nickel deposit, it actually describes about the ore forming processes in a very brief manner, but it actually shows about the source of mineralization and the host rocks and the associated geological era, as well as the forming processes. Now, I believe this is not just the information, but this is actually a concept or collective knowledge uh, information or concepts um, that is specific for this field of expertise, which is geology. And um, we, we, you can use this type of concept to build our mineral exploration framework. Now, knowledge discovery from um, written text is actually an active area of research in machine learning and AI. Now, research question that we can actually ask is that can machine reading of reports or geological reports assist us in uh, evidence-based conceptual modeling about mineral depositional conditions or, or um, forming conditions? Now, the approach that we have take is that, as I mentioned, the transforming the geological text into a structured database where knowledge can be stored, integrated, and retrieved by harnessing the advances in natural language processing, as well as syntactic, as well as semantic analysis of text. So what is the recent advances in text analysis at this stage? Now, NLP or natural language processing is a technique where used for machine reading of text. It actually applies linguistic analysis. So it actually understand the linguistic uh, construct um, of a written text and where you can see what is the noun and verb and uh, noun chunks and uh, also the adjectives and so on. So, this type of linguistic analysis is done through natural language processing paradigm. And uh, once you understand the linguistic construct, then you can actually apply this text data mining um, techniques. Now in, in text mining communities in general domain, um, it's used for text categorization, clustering, concepts, entity extraction, and document summarization. And we say that it's used a lot in social media monitoring where user sentiment, um, such as mood, emotions, and awareness has been detected um, using these data mining techniques. As I mentioned before, this interlinking of inter information is actually a, a very important aspect for geoscience. Now, if you look at this example that I embedded in this slide, it's a, a work by a Shah, um, where you can actually see an AI system where it's a question and answer system. Um, given an image, it asks questions about who is to the left of Barack Obama. It's, um, so what it does is that in the database, it has images of um, these individuals and their names. And in this case, the occupations and the date of birth, the personal information is all stored in a graphical form. This graph, the nodes 
is actually showing individuals um, or the actual their uh, occupation. And the link between these nodes actually also provides their relations between the nodes as well. So in this case, uh, we have different types of data. You have uh, image data, as well as um, this kind of information about uh, people are extracted from some text of uh, different databases. So once we have a, a knowledge base, such as shown here, then we can actually not only store, but retrieve information and provide a question and answer um, system that uh, as shown in this example. So what's happening in geological uh, world? So there's been some impressive work by Peter et al um, about the paleo deep dive or the time scale analysis of stromatolites. And this particular work in the, published in 2017 it's really reading very large number of um, uh, published literature and uh, stratigraphic database. And uh, what it really has generated is, is a structured data on the occurrences of stroma, uh, stroma, stromatolite uh, in North America over a geological time, timeline. So um, they have really successfully managed when is the um, the, the existence and uh, extinction and uh, resurgence and prevalence of these stromatolites, and what are the co-occurring events that are also um, associated with uh, prevalence of stromatolites. Um, I think another notable research in this area is a Chinese community where they actually use this um, uh, document analysis technique to generate the geological uh, knowledge graph, which I believe it's a very much associated um, based on the co-occurrence associations of geological keywords. Um, so these are the really the groups that are actively working on this uh, geological um, text mining. So, we have worked with Geological Survey of Western Australia in 2017. We did a, a feasibility study where we could extract a geological keywords and um, uh, their associations or co-occurring associations and built a report summary graph, as you can see on the top right. Um, it performed the machine reading of 20, or just over 25,000 OMEX reports from GSWA. And uh, we used this uh, core occurrence of geological keywords associations to find the similar reports, um, as well as helping search of reports using auto completion of the search terms. So, um, if you Google, let's say, VMS um, deposit, um, probably your uh, suggested word is uh, PPT or PDF, because that's how people search uh, for this kind of uh, VMS associated information. How however, in this case, this association auto-completion is strictly based on the associations that we find from our corpus. Um, another feature that it has is extracting um, figures and tables from reports. And um, this details of this work is published in all geology reviews and the demo is also available on YouTube as well. So this was a very much uh, analyzing um, reports without really considering any semantics. So it's a synthetic um, based system. So we have a PhD students in computer science called Magic Suren and Antakai Chen Shaikan. Um, she actually is working on, she's uh, nearly completing her thesis, which is building a, a knowledge graph that actually is a graph based knowledge base where you can extract, store, and retrieve 
the relations between locations, geological era, stratigraphy, rocks, minerals, and ore deposits. Um, we also collaborate this work with Paul During from GSWA. So what is knowledge graph? Knowledge graph, as I said, is some, something that stores entities like locations, geological era, stratigraphy, rocks, minerals, and ore deposits, and their relationships. And uh, why we are interested in this knowledge graph is that if we have a knowledge graph that is generated from reports, then one day we can answer questions like, what are the hosting rock types that have a highly probability of nickel deposits? Or what is the stratigraphy relation for the iron ore deposit X? Now, this knowledge graph really is a technology that's very well established and used uh, by Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. Um, they actually um, use this knowledge graph to enhance their AI systems, such as Alexa, Siri, and Google Assistant. So if you Google, in this case, um, <clears throat> Tim Cook, what you're gonna find is that you're gonna see on screen this about info box about Tim Cook. Now, this information is extracted using this knowledge graph where the nodes that actually store the entities like a name of a person or a job um, or occupation or um, the other details of the personal details and they are all stored in this knowledge graph and to extract this information about Tim Cook. Now in geological context, this is uh, probably a nice summary. If you see this text, Archean sedimentary rocks occurred within the Kalgoorlie group, and most sedimentary rocks contain either quartz and calcite. Now, our knowledge graph is shown in C. So the Archean is actually a time scale, and Kalgoorlie group is a stratigraphy, and sedimentary rock is a rock type, and the quartz and calcite is actually minerals. Now, this is what you're known as identifying or extracting um, entities. So entity extraction process, as shown in the figure on your right, is actually a process where you're recognizing for each and noun chunks and what kind of entity group it belongs to. And what we also have is this relationships, uh, like a verb relationship in most of cases, um, which actually shows what is uh, sedimentary rocks occurred within Kalgoorlie groups. Now these relations also need to be somehow generalized because there are so many expressions you can use for the same meaning. So relation ex uh, extraction um, process is also applied to generate a graph that shows not only the entity um, recognition, but also the relation recognition as well and store them in a knowledge graph. So entity extraction process is a process that uses the uh, deep learning system called bi-directional long short-term memory neural network, which is actually a, a neural network that can be used as sequence labeling. So if you look at um, this example on your right, where banded iron formation. So if you look at just the iron itself, it could be a mineral, it could be a rock. But when it's actually combined with the previous words and uh, um, preceding and uh, subsequent words, then you actually, what you're getting is a banded iron formation grouped as one and recognized as a rock. So this sequence labeling model learns this type of uh, sequential data and you can label these entity types. So we use the 500 reports um, are labeled using the dictionary and validated for the training data sets. And then the 30,000 more reports are labeled with the sequential label, uh, labeling model. 
Now, relation extraction is uh, <clears throat> another complicated one where, as I mentioned, for these relations can be expressed in very different ways um, in reports written by different geos. Um, and also, we found that these, these relations is something that we can categorize and represent more generalized relations in our knowledge graph. So how do we do it <clears throat> is using these uh, triples. So you have a head entity relation words and tail entity that are um, extracted from text and then uh, learn these um, relations as a, a, one of the general relations that we um, use for our knowledge graph. Now, this is where the transfer learning comes in because there is actually a general domain, um, a text uh, based uh, a text is used to pre uh, for the pre-trained model, which actually we brought into geological domain and further trained um, to generate these um, relations. So again, it's a bidirectional um, LSTM um, method that I used here. And probably you'll be more interested in looking at some results here. So this is one of the reports that we use to validate our method, which is the, about the gold deposit in the Kulgadi gold project. Now, the Kulgadi, as you see in the middle, the large yellow dot called Kulgadi, and uh, which is actually um, connected to the Menzies Norseman green belt, greenstone belt um, through this Kalgoli terrain. So as you look at these kind of uh, nodes about the locations, these are all kind of uh, acceptable and uh, making sense um, about the area. Well, this is another subgraph. As you can imagine, knowledge graph is very vast. So we have to uh, visualize it using a subgraph. In this case, subgraph about the stratigraphy, time scale, and rocks. Now, um, all the rock types as shown in this uh, orange color in the text, they're all appearing in this knowledge graph correctly. Now, the interesting thing is this uh, stratigraphy that's shown in this graph. Now, as you can see that, that the Kalguli group um, contains Kulgadi subgroup, and which contains Lindsay basalt, Gleason's basalt, and Brilliant formation. And as you can see, the relations words, the contains are all kind of put in correctly. And also the black flag group overlain by the Gleason basalt um, is actually presented here. You might be wondering, how do you extract this correct kind of stratigraphic sequence the, from the um, exploration reports because people don't have this type of information really um, clearly in the reports uh, because we actually incorporated another database. Um, in this case, the Australian Stratigraphic Unit Database uh, to generate this hierarchical relationship between the stratigraphic units. Um, another important thing that we notice here is that the, because uh, ASUD has got these name changes uh, shown in the actual the database, so that's been incorporated into this knowledge graph as well. So as you can see, the Brilliant Formation's current name is a current name of Brilliant Ultramafix. So, as you see here, the stratigraphic information, the hierarchy within this knowledge graph is really uh, based on another um, database that we incorporated. Now, I mean, this is becoming a little bit tedious because uh, what I'm really showing is that these different entities um, that are really and uh, known to be important and appears in the reports are correctly represented in our knowledge graph. Um, important here is uh, that relations are also represented correctly, such as gold occurs in quartz and uh, gold hosted in sulfide 
and the Kulgadi contains gold and gold deposit dominated by gold. These are the kind of relationships that are, are correctly represented in the knowledge graph, uh, which is really uh, uh, robustly and very effectively uh, the extracting these type of entities and relations that truly um, reflects the actual the source document. So what are we doing with this knowledge graph is that really we want to use this not only just the uh, question and answer system one day, but I think immediately this is something that we can apply for intelligent spatial search system. So um, for example, we, can, uh, we need to improve this visualization, of course, this knowledge graph, but uh, we can actually um, use it to extract and spatially search for key relationship between entities. So what is the mineralization and hosting rock relationships? And can we use this one relation we found in for one deposit can be searched elsewhere and to find um, areas where it have a similar relationships. And also we can actually extract anomalous relationships that uh, is actually conflicting with the known knowledge. And um, also we can actually search for um, something that we tried uh, through our project, student project is a near mix exploration cases. So we can actually locate them. Uh, this is a lot more trickier than you think. So uh, it's a very much an ongoing work. And as I mentioned before, again, that interlinking of databases is actually a very important aspect of the future work. So all this work is published um, in different um, journals and uh, some computer, one is actually a couple of computer science and you should be able to um, find details in these um, literatures. Now, in summary, um, I presented two uh, very different studies. One is um, really using a drill hole um, data of multimodal drill hole data and how we incorporated human intelligence and machine intelligence and existing or all data to really help them um, make decisions on the stratigraphic um, interpretation task for drill holes. Now the language process, lang natural language processing, machine learning and AI, we've seen a potential for future, how we can use to extract and use geological information to really bring um, our insights to uh, geological knowledge that help us to develop a better exploration model, for example. Um, I also want to end my presentation. Um, thank to our sponsors um, and, and supporters of our work, um, as well as giving you some recent um, papers that may be of interest for the geophysics group here. So I think the um, interesting work that which I didn't have a time to include is the Tom Horrocks' PhD thesis that were one of the chapters were recently uh, published, which is a Gaussian process regression model for 3D geochem interpolation supported by geophysics inversion models. This is where um, geochem uh, concentration value is interpolated, in this case, specifically magnesium, um, which interpolation is derived by a various geophysical inversion models. Um, this is where, how do you actually fill in the gap between uh, drill holes is actually key is fusing um, other available data sets, in this case, the geophysical inversion models. Um, and also you can go through the list, but uh, the color map that Peter Kvesi has made it available to wider communities has been uh, had a significant uptake. And if you're a geophysicist who hasn't been exposed to this uh, uh, perceptually uniform color maps, probably it's worth a look at on his website. Well, I think that's uh, about it from me and I'm willing to take uh, questions.
Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, I unfortunately am struggling to find a Q&A button. Um, I, know, I know there's people have had troubles at the moment with Zoom going from one version to another. Can you see the Q&A on your screen, EJ? Uh, no, I don't, but I think you can use chat. Yeah. Yeah. So if I will anyone, stop sharing it and uh, yeah. Thank you. If anyone has managed to, if anyone still does have a Q&A button um, and they've put a question in there, if you could just paste it into the chat, that would be great. Sorry to be a pain. <laughs> Um, so we have a question from David Annette's a great talk, especially for the first of 2021. I'm curious as to whether Maddie can be used to refine an exploration strategy, whether, for example, it can indicate the influence of different data sets on an ML output. Yeah, that's is a, a interesting question. Um, I'm actually a uh, doing some teaching in the uh, data science uh, course in computer science department here. And uh, one of the topics that I gave was about the um, translatable or interpretable um, machine learning. And um, the, there are systems that you can use to actually see the influences of the different data sets. Uh, what we have taken for MEDI is that we are basically uh, giving the visualization of the outputs so that uh, people can actually assess the validity of uh, different um, data sets and how the different strand units are um, detected. But if you're talking about within one data set, for example, uh, geochemistry, or what is the influence of uh, different um, elements for the outputs, we haven't done that. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any more questions, but I had one um, about, so you kind of transitioned from uh, data science into geoscience and using data science for that. Do you have any advice for people who are geoscientists and really wanting to use sort of more kind of machine learning approaches or more generally data science approaches to their problems? Like where, where can you start? Because it's a little bit yeah. difficult sometimes. Uh, even though I call myself data scientist, this is actually uh, quite, because in my days, we just called ourselves computer scientists. <laughs> and and uh, I think for geoscientists, I've noticed in industry and academia in geoscience, um, a lot of work that uses uh, machine learning or automated methods is basically, um, it's very suitable for research. But um, I, think, I think the validation and also um, using these uh, methods with a bit of a caution is actually very important. Um, so you just train a model and say, oh, you just identified the 90, whatever, 7% um, accuracy. But at the end of the day, the 3% that you missed, uh, how important that is and why they were misclassified is something that you need to explore. Um, so I think, you know, has been a great um, uptake of these kind of computational methods for uh, geoscientists nowadays. And um, I think more in the future, yes. Um, I think it's, it's good to, there are lots of training courses available online <laughs> on data science and uh, I think the, yeah, using it with a caution is uh, probably advice I can give. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like good advice. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Nick Williams. Uh, thanks, EJ. I was interested to see you included historical models and lithological logs in the MADI learning. Were you to go the other way and update or refine those more interpretive products? Why were those additions necessary and how much impact do they have on the results? Yeah, sorry, I can't really answer you that question, Nick. Um, Hi, nice to see you, <laughs> not see you, but uh, talk to you. But um, in this case, I am, I can't really, sorry. I, I can find out a bit more details from the geos um, at Rio Tinto and probably I can get back to you. Um, but what we have done is 
we by working closely with them and see what they actually do in their manual interpretation. And these are the data sets actually people do refer to when they interpret drillable data. So we integrated them. So I guess it all depending on the who is actually doing the interpretation, you can turn them off really. So we have that uh, methods, uh, blending methods that you can actually um, bring it in or you can give them zero weight for those. Yeah. Yeah, it's good flexibility. Um, we have a question from Hoi Wang. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. One quick question. In the first part of the presentation, you mentioned using convolution networks to analysis curves. Did you use 1D convolutional layers in the network? Yes. Oh. All right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Is anyone frantically typing away trying to get one in before I... <laughs> Um, just check I haven't missed any as well. I think your talk also was very comprehensive, so not many questions can come out of it. <laughs> All right. Yep, just lots of thanks coming through. So hopefully um, everyone's got their questions in. Um, but thank you very much for giving a great talk. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. And as David said, um, great start to 2021 in our ASCG webinar series. And thank you to everyone who attended. And um, yeah, we'll have more coming for you in the next few weeks. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, Kate. No worries. Thanks. Bye, everyone.